Hi everyone, it's that time again, there's a new Blender release, version 3.4. So as usual, what we're going to do is take a look through the new release page and just have a little discussion about what's available. This is something we do every time there's a major update. I know a lot of people like these videos, so grab a drink and we'll take a look. So the tagline for this release is Guiding Star, and the cover artwork here is actually from the new Blender Open movie, which was called Project Heist, but its new name has been revealed as Charge, and I believe it'll be premiering later on this month. So let's see. Blender Foundation and the online developers community present Blender 3.4. Featuring path guiding in cycles, new sculpt and paint masking tools, geometry nodes viewport overlay, new UV editing tools, improved performance and much more. So that's a pretty good summary of what's available. The pathfinding is really cool, we're going to take a look at that. It basically improves the accuracy of the rendering in cycles so that you won't need to use as many samples, basically reducing the overall rendering time required. The sculpt and paint masking tools are fantastic as well. We might be able to take a little look in Blender for a quick demonstration. The geometry nodes viewport overlay is great for basically previewing what you're creating in geometry nodes. And and everything else is just the icing on top. As usual, on the official Blender channel, they've got Sub and Shotty to do a quick rundown of the new Blender features in under 5 minutes. These are always enjoyable videos. Cycles Path Guiding Blender 3.4 integrates Intel's Open Path Guiding library, adding support for path guiding in the CPU to help reduce noise in scenes where finding a path to light is difficult for regular path tracing. For example, when a room is lit by light coming through a small door crack. So I'm sure if you've been doing environment art in Cycles, you've kind of encountered this problem before. The, if you're relying quite heavily on bounce lighting in the scene, it's quite difficult to get accurate results. The more the light has to bounce, the noisier it gets. This is something that the path guiding is trying to tackle. Guiding is supported for surfaces with diffuse BSDFs and volumes with isotropic and anisotropic scattering, or anisotropic scattering, pick your pronunciation. Important light directions are learned over time, improving as more samples are taken. So it's more of a smart sampling method. Find it in the sampling panel in the render properties. So here are a couple of comparisons. You can see we have an underwater scene here with some core sticks going on. And this is a really good comparison scene because you can just see the immediate difference here. You can almost see none of the caustic effect without the path guiding, and using what I assume is the same number of samples, we have an immediately much more accurate and fantastic result, not just on the water surface but also on the seabed. It says, note that while path guiding helps to render scenes containing simple caustics, example water surface, it is not designed to be a caustic solver, such as MNEE, meaning it might not help render scenes containing complex caustics. I mean that's quite often the thing with new algorithms, they're always quite situational, with trade-offs. So here's another comparison, the same render time with and without path guiding. And this is a good demonstration of specifically the greater accuracy provided by the path guiding method, despite having the same rendering time without. I have tested this and I have seen an improvement in the quality, so I think this is a fantastic feature to add. I love that they're still making improvements to cycles and I hope they do continue because I thought we were already quite spoiled with cycles in Blender. Like there was always space for improvement, but you know, then the Cycles X project came along and they just keep adding these performance improvements like time and time again. And it's great to see. And even when I did like the NVIDIA sponsorship back in 2021, speaking to them it was clear that they kind of understood the potential of the engine and it's something they really wanted to focus on when it came to like explaining the hardware and software available for creatives more specifically the gpus and studio drivers there's still so much potential i haven't explored with the engine and it's just crazy that this is available in like a free and open source software so i hope you're feeling as grateful as i am out there because i, I just love cycles but that's not all they added even more improvements so sampling added sobol burly sampling pattern improved the progressive multi-jittered sampling for the graphics drivers intel arc on Windows upgrade to driver version 101.3430, audio to fix user interface crashes. Okay, that's nice for Intel Arc users. It's nice that there is support for Intel Arc and I hope that continues as well because I think it'll be nice for Intel to continue growing in this graphic space. For AMD HIP on Linux, upgrade to a new version to fix issues with texturing on Vega and RDNA 1 graphics cards. And for Apple Metal, Intel GP rendering is now supported starting with Mac OS 13. Okay, great for Mac users. So yeah, all these different options for rendering have not been left behind. Lovely to see. Attribute node, access geometry nodes, instance attributes, new mode for accessing attributes of the current view layer, scene or world, and with baking, new option to bake specular effects from the active camera view instead of above the surface. This may be useful when baking textures that will be viewed from a fixed position or with limited camera motion. All of the updates and changes they put in these little boxes are usually for kind of more specific use cases, but I figure I'll read them out because they're probably helpful to some people out there. But let's get down to another one of the big features, auto masking. The auto masking settings in sculpt mode are now accessible from the header in the 3D viewport. New methods have been added for automatically masking by cavity, viewpoint, and area. So this is something I like because it reminds me of 3D Coat a little bit. The sculpting and painting tool set in 3D Coat is really cool and really intuitive because it kind of presents you with all the tools like right there, right around the interface. And it always felt so intuitive to use. So I kind of like this one, even just from like a user experience perspective. I'll show you a bit more about this. So deep, instead of manually creating a cavity mask, this auto masking option provides a faster, 
way of painting and sculpting with cavity, marvelous. Use the create mask button to convert the auto mask into a regular mask attribute to edit it further or just visualize it. So you can see here, let's take a quick look in Blender. So I'm in Blender now and I'm gonna bring in a character object. This may look familiar if you've seen my recent video about new way to light characters in Blender. I'm just gonna bring in this character model by Daniel Bystedt, unpack it with my modular workspaces add-on, and let's take something like, I suppose, this cloth piece around the character. It's not the highest poly object you've ever seen, but the thing I wanna point out is if we go to the sculpt mode, and of course we have all of our regular sculpting tools, but if we go to the top here, this small button, auto masking, I'm not gonna explain everything, but there are a couple of things which I think you'll be really interested in if you do a lot of sculpting. First of all, if we click on topology, and actually let's change to the um, helmet object because this is going to be a better demonstration for this one. If you're sculpting over an object that has several distinct parts, usually when you're moving your brush over them, you're kind of affecting them all at the same time and they start intersecting and it's very weird. But if you have topology enabled in the auto masking, it will prevent that from happening. So basically if you're sculpting on one specific piece, it's not going to affect the neighbor mesh pieces, which is very handy. As you can see, if we turn that off and then you sculpt over the top, it's going to do them all at the same time and you can very quickly mess up the mesh that way. So if you want to sculpt details on one specific area without affecting the neighbor mesh pieces, you can do that easily by enabling the topology and the auto masking. As for the new cavity option, if we go into the sculpt mode on the cloth piece, if we click on cavity, you'll see these options appear. If we turn the factor up and then press create mask, it's going to create a mask based on, well, the cavity. Basically, the lower areas of the mesh are going to be masked out, which make it easier to sculpt on top of. Also, you can do the inverted option as well. If you take that and then create the mask and it will do the opposite. Again, this isn't a super high poly demonstration, but you can kind of see how that would be useful. Again, on this new feature page on the website, whenever there's like an important piece of information you're interested in, you can always click on read more and it will take you to either the documentation or like a task page, which basically explains what the feature is. Or we'll provide Provide you of a history of the discussion around the feature if it's a task. So there's always more information to study here. All right, let's keep going down. So mask from cavity. This is an operation. Inverted factor blur and a custom curve give extra control to fine tune the cavity mask. This is basically showing that we can get more accurate masks from cavities like we just took a look at in the sculpting demonstration. So maybe let's take a quick look at a demonstration of that. Again, if we go into the sculpt mode, we know that when we grab our cavity, it looks like this. Quick, but maybe a bit messy. If we press F3 and then go to mask from cavity, we'll get the operation in the bottom left, you can collapse and expand that, and then there'll be more options here. So we can always blur that mask result to get a kind of less accurate, but I guess kind of nicer result. And you can also use a custom curve for describing this as well. So this actually looks really helpful. You can kind of like customize the curvature profile, scrubbing the factor value, that's quite satisfying. Anyway, yeah, cool feature. Next section, auto masking in action. Combine different methods to easily sculpt and paint little details. So let's take a look. First of all, we have the view normal option. Oh, interesting. Okay, so you can like grab a mask from the view position. That's quite handy. Also, I didn't realize there was a pie menu for the different masking sets. That's quite cool. Also, I should say Sculpt January is coming up. Basically a month long challenge where you create sculpts all the way throughout the month based on prompts. It's a really good way to kind of help you develop your skills if you're interested in challenges. I recommend checking it out. It's hosted by CG Boost. Let's take a look at the next masking option. We have the area normal. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Seems to be done based on most I imagine like a plane where you start painting the mask or something. I might need to test that one out if that works kind of how I think it does. Yeah, use the normal direction of the brush cursor from the start of the stroke. Okay, that yeah, that makes sense. Cavity, sculpt or paint parts of the mesh sticking in or out. This is my favorite one. There you go, they're kind of painting a mask around all the tiny details and the surface imperfections are very cool. Cavity is great for everything. Fantastic for procedural materials. And there's more for this section as well. So faster reprojecting attributes using the voxel remesher. Performance improvements when not using face sets and masks. That's good. The rest of us that don't really use face sets or masks don't want to be held back by these features. I'm kidding. Weight and vertex painting will use the whole modifier stack if it produces no topology changes. That's cool. Face sets are now opt-in, meaning that primitive objects do not have a face set attribute by default. Okay, that's fair. UV and chill. So we have a bunch of new UV tools in this update. First of all, there's the relax tool. The new geometry based relax brush method helps you improve the quality of the UV mapping by making the UVs more closely follow the 3D geometry. As this is a brush, the user can drive the relaxation process. So this is basically inside of the UV editor. From what I understand, you can basically paint the brush over the UV sets and it will kind of just relax them into a smoother state. Several improvements in the UV editor grid include non-uniform grids, which is called 
cool. I suppose if you're doing these kind of like non-uniform tile maps of some kind, then a non-uniform grid would be handy for that. There's also now pixel spacing and draw grid on top of the image. That would also be handy for like tile set based stuff because you'll still be able to see where the grid is to make sure everything lines up okay, even if you have an image loaded. You can also align rotation, rotate UVs to follow the geometry orientation in the 3D viewport or aligned to a selected edge or automatically guess the best orientation. So you can see how this works here. They're basically aligning it based on their selection, but there are also other options available. Randomize islands, quickly set a random value to the scale, rotation or offset of selected UV islands. And there's more. So live unwrap support for the grab tool, support for pinned vertices in the UV sculpt tools, fixed boundary edges for relax tool laplation method, constraint to bounds for UV sculpt tools, UV selection support in many operations, prevent orphaned islands in UV sculpt tools, support constraint to bounds in the rotation operator, add option to use Blender 2.8 margin calculation, many UV packing operations now work with non-manifold geometry, that's pretty cool, and several fixes. Okay next up is a really big feature for geometry nodes users, and this is the viewer node. So what you see is what you get, introducing viewport overlay for geometry nodes viewer node, previewing attributes without affecting the final result. This is a way you can visualize how you're constructing your geometry nodes inside of the 3D view. Let's take a look at a quick demonstration. Okay, so see here how they're plugging different things into the viewer node, and depending on what they're plugging in in the GeoNodes tree, they can actually see the result being generated in the 3D view. So you can essentially sample different parts of the node tree to make sure everything's working appropriately. The intensity of the overlay can be adjusted from the overlay popover in the 3D viewport header. Okay, lovely. I imagine this will be great for people that don't really like looking in the spreadsheet view as well, because I've never used that while using geometry nodes. I tend to just like eyeball everything. Next up, sample UV surface, a new node to get actual attribute values based on UV coordinates, a simple concept that opens endless opportunities. This is a really cool demonstration because it basically shows how, you know, having more options to sample data between different parts of Blender, in this case more specifically the UV editor, means you can create these really complex effects. Notice how the stitching on the text is kind of expanding based on like the UV scale there. It's a really cool demonstration. Also, like a lot of the demonstrations that they show on these pages, you can download some files. So see here, sample UV surface node, download this file, and then if you click on that link, you'll be able to grab the blend file. There are even more nodes for geometry nodes as well. So a lot of these are for mesh selection and manipulation. So face set boundaries, the new face set boundaries node finds the edges between different patches of faces, corners of face slash vertex, corners of face retrieves corners that make up a face and corners of vertex retrieves face corners connected to vertices. These descriptions are quite a mouthful. But also once again, you can click on any of these and then it'll take you to the documentation where you can find more information about the inputs and the outputs if you want more of a description. And I'm sure there'll be like more tutorial content coming out from people around the community as well soon, so there should be more educational content available about these nodes in a relatively short amount of time. Edges of corner slash vertex, so this gets the edges on both sides of a face corner, while edges of vertex retrieves the edges connected to each vertex. These are basically self-explanatory now, I don't, I don't have to read the descriptions for all of these. Basically it's a lot of nodes to select all these different connective parts of meshes. There are new curve nodes as well, so a curve of point, points of curve, offset point in curve, so you can grab all the data along curves if you like, set curve normal and sum curve and more generalized nodes for kind of multi-purpose usage. Self object retrieves the current modify object for retrieving transforms. I think I'm going to find this one quite useful. Sample index retrieves data from specific geometry elements by index. Sample nearest retrieves the indices from the closest geometry elements. I imagine this is great for proximity effects. Sample nearest surface interpolates a field input to the closest location on a mesh surface. And finally, distribute points in volume. Yes. So up until this update, we've had to use custom distribute points and volume nodes. In fact, I'm using them in Bygen and modular workspaces, I believe. So we finally have a way of doing it in base geometry nodes. So distribute points in volume creates points inside of volume grids. Okay, so as you can see here, I've just quickly put this together. We have a cube, just a basic cube, and then we're doing mesh to volume and then distribute points in volume. And then that's basically giving us our distribution throughout the volume space of the object. So there are lots of different parameters in there you can modify. You can also do them on a more predictable grid level, which I think is really cool as well. So I'm glad to see that feature is finally here. But there's of course more stuff in geometry nodes. So node group assets are visible in the add menu of the node editor. Trim curves node now supports cyclic curves. Data block user count visible in the context path and group node node header, new preference to duplicate node groups, better looking node links, input sockets are reused when creating new node groups, node groups can now be duplicated with Alt D, trim curves are now 3 to 4 times faster, attributes of instances are now accessible from materials through the attribute node and a new faster evaluation system. Lovely. 
actually. Lots of good work done there. So there's been some pretty cool stuff added for Grease Pencil. First of all, the fill tool has been greatly improved with new options, shortcuts, and introducing a new algorithm to close gaps. The new method uses the radius of circumference to determine how close to strokes for filling. Hold on, I'm not sure that sentence makes sense. The new method uses the radius of circumference to determine how close the strokes for filling or how to close the strokes for filling. This new method is very effective when the extension done by the previous method, now renamed as extend, of the strokes never cross. Use the mouse wheel or page up and down to adjust the length of the strokes, S key to toggle the extender method, use the D key to toggle extended stroke collision. In the Southern Shotty video on the main Blender channel, they show more of these grease pencil features visually so you can see how they work, it's really cool. There's also like a new inbuilt storyboarding add-on I believe. You can also import multiple SVG files at once. There's a new offset parameter in the reproject operator for the surface mode. Set the start point operator for cyclic strokes. New chain mode in the time offset modifier. For line art, there's forced intersection. For Python, there's a new trace frame parameter in the trace operator. And a new outline modifier to generate perimeter stroke from the camera view. If we click through to take a look at the grease pencil changes, you can see we have some image based explanations for what's changed. So we're coming to the end of the update now, but there's some extra stuff. For animation and rigging, there are a few things including NLA improvements and the ability to mute drivers. For Core Blender there are several new changes including font improvements, support for FFmpeg AV1 codecs, encoding that is, metables are now evaluated as meshes, higher resolution thumbnails in Windows Explorer, improved performance for subdivision surface modifier, speed ups when batch creating objects, for better performance optimized evaluation of disabled modifiers, for EV and viewport there's headless rendering support on Linux, for the OBJ importer a new global scale factor, improved care when editing text objects, which is like that little thing you see flashing when you're typing, I believe. New shortcuts in the Python console editor, outliner improvements, the import image as plain add-on has an improved user interface, there's a new add-on for story pencil, so that's when I mentioned about storyboarding with grease pencil. They probably should have moved that one further up into the grease pencil section, but anyway that's there. Python API, Blender is a Python module, internal mesh format changes, new functions and breaking changes, the funnest part of the update for me. And of course, if you want to get the file for the splash screen artwork, because Blender is free and open source. The splash screen art files are available for anyone to download so you can take a look. They're cool demonstrations and like examples of how to make stuff with Blender so it's really fun dissecting them and seeing how they were made. So yeah that's the update. So if you made it this far through the video make sure to put a donut emoji in the comments. This helps me to see who you are still watching this video. It gives me a better indication than the YouTube analytics for who makes it this far and I tend to remember a lot of the faces, well profile pictures. Also consider signing up to the Blender Development Fund. We get all of these fantastic updates for free and I just think we're really spoilt so yeah maybe give it a look there's also the blender studio where you can get educational content access to files especially from the open movie projects there's just there's lots of stuff to dive into also if you like this video consider subscribing we do these update videos every time there's a major blender update we do community roundups where we take a look at exciting stuff happening in and around the blender community and a bunch of other content as well so thanks for watching everyone stay safe and i will see you next time